Hello, friends, and happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Sabbath School study. Before we could begin, let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this time that you have given us. We surrender this study into your hands. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be there with us throughout this study, keep us from every distraction, and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This week's study is titled Worshiping the Creator. What do you mean by worshiping this one? As a memory text so beautifully puts it, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you create all things, and by you they, they exist and they are created. So the worship is an act of uh, giving glory, honor, and ascribing to a to a being whom we believe is greater than ourselves. Uh, all these things, glory, honor, and power. When it is ingrained in the human being to worship, because God made us in His own image and. Sub in our inmost mind, subconsciously, we, we perceive a connection, and that's why we keep searching for uh, that being. And uh, and whatever we perceive as a greater being or a greater uh, greater purpose, or for some people it may be a purpose. For others who know God, it is God. It is their God, and we ascribe for glory and honor to such a being, and it becomes. Part of it and becomes worship. That's what I believe is worship. Worship is. Why do we need to worship? Well, by the way, see, it, uh, this say, very verse gives a very beautiful reason for you create all things and by your will they exist and they created. God not only created us, He also sustains us. And, and for that, for that, we, we ought to give back thanks to Him. He not only created us, he not only uh, gives us life, but also all the things that we that we have in life, the food that we have, the health that we enjoy, uh, the good things surrounding us, even though sin has marred and we suffer a lot, but still there is so much goodness in life and we owe it to God uh, for everything that we enjoy. Many times we take for granted, for example, the sunshine, the, the water that we get, the air that we breathe, and we take all of these for granted as if they uh, God owes us and therefore he gives us not nothing. And there's nothing like that. God is giving everything because he loves us. <clears throat> and as a thank, uh, as, uh, as, as a part of thanking God, that as a part of gratitude to God, we uh, worship him. And more than that, more than that, the act of worship, I believe, constitutes a part of beholding. So when you worship somebody, your mind goes on to the person and stays on the person. And the Bible says, we behold him and by this act of beholding him, we have changed into his own image. And that is why, that is the reason why God strictly forbids idols. He doesn't want us to behold an idol. And even if we think that it is God whom we worship, and this idol is just an object to represent God, the very fact that we are beholding the idol instead of keeping our keeping our mind and trying to trying to find traces of God, trying, trying to imagine how God will be, it 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 changes us into the very image of the idol instead of changing us into the image of God. And so uh, worship changes us. It's not it's not a one way it's not a one way act, but it transforms us and slowly changes us. So the more we worship, the more we keep our mind on the being who's worship the more we change. And so that I believe is a part of the theory's message. The central theme of the end's message is worship. First angel is calling uh, us to worship. Second angel is warning not to side with the people who do not worship God. And the third angel is giving a, 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 a result of what will happen if we side with the wrong group. If we side with the wrong group, you will be punished. That that is the that is the third angel's message. So in, in summary, this all three messages, they are centered on worship. Whom do we worship and how do we worship? And so <clears throat> worship is a, is a is a thing that we need to consider very seriously. And whom do, who are we worshiping in the RPM? And how are we responding to this call of God who is calling us to worship? So basically. Worship, it gives us a reason for living. It gives us not only something to die for, but also even more significantly something to live for. That's what the author has told very beautifully. And he also added, he also adds, 
it's necessary to endure tribulations for. So I think the worship here, it just doesn't stop with uh, probably like most of us might be thinking worshiping is when uh, we um, singing songs and uh, praying, praising God, um, attending services, uh, something like that. But I, I think it goes even beyond and to um, to see how our lives are, how we are living our life. For, are we going to live for Christ? Uh, by worshipping, is, is, are we going to bring in some change in our life? Or it's just, it's just part of prayer, part of devotion, or it's a lifestyle. Worshipping is a lifestyle or, uh, or what? So we see... In many places, worship King of Kings, worship the Lord of Lords. But here, uh, specifically, it's given worship the Creator. Now, we're all Christians, and like as true Christians, most of us I know, uh, we believe in Genesis one one. In the beginning, God made heaven and earth. Um, but why, why this message here, worship the Creator? Um, the angel could have told John, Jesus could have told John, you can just write us worship uh, the Lord worship of God, God, King of Kings. Why worship the Creator? Why do we need to? Is the creative power related to the worship? Like, if, of our understanding <coughs> of God's creative power, why is it necessary? Well, creation is the central reason why. Uh, we need to worship God at all. See, if, if, the, if God has not created us, then, then what is the relationship with Him? We have nothing to do with Him. He is just a being who is so powerful, that's it. He, we don't sustain any direct relationship with Him. The reason why we worship Him, we owe Him so much, is because He created us. If He gave us life, He's sustaining our life, not only our life, He's sustaining the life of all our friends, our, our relatives, our neighbors people who we meet, and not just that, he sustaining the lives of all the things that are essential for life, for our life, to be uh, happy, to be uh, successful. For example, food. He sustaining the life of all the crops, the trees, the plants, so that by their growth, we can get our food. So on and so forth. The clothes that we wear, because God sustains the plants, the animals that are, that are essential to make the things that we bear, that we stay in, the homes, and so on and so forth. So we owe God. We are, we are in a sense, bound to be grateful to Him. Whether we recognize it or not, whether we do it or not, we owe God everything. And therefore, creation is the central reason for worship. You see, even in the Sabbath, the commandment, which is which is, uh, in a sense, in a sense, the uh, worship is very closely associated with the Sabbath day. And in the Sabbath, we find God could have given any reason. God could have simply said, remember the Sabbath, remember, I mean, keep the Sabbath day holy, and, and people have finished the commandment. But God gives a reason, and he says, you should keep it holy because I am the creator, because I created you, and I am asking you to do it. And, and, the and in the Sabbath day, all we do is worship. We come to into God's presence. We sit. We sit at His feet. We sing songs. We thank Him. We uh, we spend the entire day at His feet, and, and it's an act of worship. And God has associated this eternally with the creation in His Ten Commandments. So worship becomes meaningful only if we worship the Creator. Otherwise, it is just a relationship between two. Two beings, two peers, two, which is not innate, which is not original, or which is, which is something forged by the beings. Rather, creator is, is uh, we are, you know, in a sense, we are, we are by nature connected to God. This connection is not artificial. This connection is not man made. It is by nature, by birth, we are linked to Him. And so, creation is the central reason why we should worship. The, the author has given very beautifully, we will never fully understand the issues in this cosmic battle over worship unless we understand the significance of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Notice how uh, 
Bible is a very important book. It is a holy book. And it just starts with one thing. In the beginning, God created judgment. There's nothing about judgment. There's nothing about second coming of Christ. Nothing about resurrection. But just this. Because all those are hidden in this one sentence. Maybe all of that makes sense because of this yeah, this one verse in the beginning, God created it. It's because God created that all of them exist. But everything that happens after that, the, the sin, the fall, the sin, the need for a savior, the manifestation of God's love in the cross, all of this became essential, became possible because of that one verse in the beginning, God created us. And therefore, he took responsibility for us. And he revealed his love to us by dying on the cross. And creation reveals a God of awesome might and unlimited power. This creative power not only brought the heavens and earth into existence, but also has worked in behalf of his people through the centuries. We need to know the creative power of God because it is the same creative power that he uses to recreate us. Now that we are being redeemed to recreate us from the sinful life to help us to walk after his spirit, to walk, uh, to, to be like him. Sometimes we think it's impossible. We think maybe it was possible for Jesus. It's impossible for us. We, we give up so easily and uh, like, what do you say, there are Jacob's time of trouble is coming and we need this. We need to know that the God who created the heavens and the earth is so much interested in each one of our lives and he is ready to recreate us and he uses that same power. So Jesus as Redeemer and Jesus as Creator very closely uh, they, they, they are they are closely connected. So in order for us to know or understand that the love of God through Jesus, we also need to know his creative power. And they're all related together. And that is why around that time when um, when when the first angel's message came around 1844, there's a quotation which says, God knew before sees. And this three angels message was given to a people um, of this age where they will go after evolution and not after creation. And Evolution attacks on all these important things that we are studying. As you said, if there is no creation, then there's no need of judgment, no Sabbath, nothing. And evolution targets all these. And it was exactly at this time that the first angel's message came telling, worship God, the creator. And maybe for us, we do know God created heavens and earth. We may not believe in evolution, but it's an important reminder for us to know that God uses that power uh, to recreate us, provided we are be we are willing to be recreated. It, it is it is such an incredible thought to so, to think that the God who created all of that is close to us. Just imagine the the awesomeness of our of our God, the greatness of our God, as you see, as, as you study more, as you understand more of how things were, how things actually are, as you as you see the scale of things, the grand scale of things, our planet, the solar system, the sun, and <clears throat> the galaxies, the other stars that are bigger than our sun, the amount of energy, the power that they exude, the, the amount of orderliness that is necessary to keep even a cell alive, when you think of all these things, when you go deeper and deeper, it becomes grander and grander, and you see that our God is, is an amazing God, it's an awesome God, it's, as the Bible says so beautifully, there is no searching of his understanding. His understanding is infinite, and that is revealed so beautifully in his creation. The more we study creation, the more we understand how awesome, how terrifyingly great our God is. There is, there is, there is, there is nothing we can. I mean, there, there, I, I, there will never come a point of time where we can fully appreciate the greatness, the awesomeness of a God. The more we understand, the more the bigger He will seem. The more, the, the, the more infinite He will seem. 
And so to think that such a being who inhabits eternity, can you just imagine that that phrase, that phrase has, has, um, has, uh, has kept me thinking for long, long, long times. It's a being who inhabits eternity. We are beings who, who live in mortality. Someone who, I, I don't even know how to express that thought, who, who inhabits unendingness. Such a being says, I live with people who are broken. I, live, I, I also live with a person who is a, a humble and a contrite spirit. I revive, I recreate such people. And I delight to dwell amongst, amidst such people. It is, it is so intriguing. It's, so, it's such an awesome thought to have such a being right next to us. Jesus promised. Um, Jesus promised that when you are here, he will be there. Amar Amar says that, that he will come and he will fellowship with us. Jesus says, and he says, you know, his hand go and knock. If you open the door, I will come in and eat with you. I will sit and we eat together. It is a privilege to have fellowship with the Father and the Son. As John says so beautifully in the book of First John, that we have fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And, and it's such an awesome thought that the great God is just so close to us. And, and it is the, uh, all of this is brought into view in the first sentence message. God is giving us a warning that end of all things is going to happen and we need to get ready, that we need to set our priorities right and we need to search God and, and make sure with whom our allegiance, allegiance lies. Is it with God? Or is it with other powers in this earth? And so God is asking us to, to view him as a creator, someone who created everything, someone to whom greatness and power belong. And he is bringing, he's bringing one more reason to worship. It's not just because he created everything, it's because he's going to judge everything. And that is being brought into view in the first instance. God is telling, I am the creator and therefore I have the right to judge, and I will judge every thought, every motive, every action, every word, everything that they've ever done, it's, uh, and if they've ever thought it's going to bring, it's going to be brought into view in the courts of heaven, and it's going to be judged. And God has a right to do it because He's a creator. And so we have to set our priorities right to worship God. And not just the right to judge, but also. The right to free us from the condemnation. Mm -hmm. so if at all we have been, uh, we have been, we have all, we all sinners, and we're still striving to uh, lead that sinless life, and so that we we are not held uh, in that under the condemnation of our past lives. God gives us that power, and He has the power to um, make us free from the condemnation, provided we are willing to. Walk, uh, to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. Woman, eight, Romans eight one says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, which is the good news of the judgment and which is the gospel. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, and worshiping the Creator. In in if you look it from another view, we can we can also say that worshiping the Creator simply means when we are accepting to walk after the spirit. And that power Jesus is giving us, are we accepting that and are we going to do that? And we are called to do that in these last days. So we see uh, one, one interesting point about creation is God created from nothing. The human beings to create something, we need something. We cannot create anything from nothing, but God created from nothing. And so He's willing to, if we are willing to be recreated, we should empty out ourselves completely and Amen. he will recreate us again. So, worshipping is in one sense when we are accepting to walk after Christ. Uh, here, worshipping the creator is we need to worship truly and we need to worship the true God. And no true worship comes by disobeying the commandments. Every true worship is related to keeping the commandments. So, 
we need to follow and keep the Ten Commandments and obey the commandments, especially the fourth commandment, which is linked to worshiping the Creator and worshiping as such. So, so it's it's it deals with how to worship and who to worship and when to worship. So that doesn't mean only Saturday. We have to worship every day, but on Saturday especially, we are called to worship and to keep the Sabbath, especially in these last days. I'd like to read uh, one uh, quotation. So beautifully says, it was at the cross that mercy and truth met together. That righteousness and truth kissed each other. That every student and every worker studied this again and again. That they, setting forth the Lord crucified among us, may make it a fresh subject to the people. Show that the life of Christ reveals an infinitely perfect character. Teach that as many as receive him, to them daily power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1. 12. Tell it over and over again. We may become the sons of God, members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king. Let it be known that all who accept Jesus Christ and hold the beginning of their confidence from to them will be heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. What a privilege it is, brethren and friends, to become sons and daughters of God. And we have to keep telling it again and again, as many as receive him, to them give power. If we would receive him, we would receive the power to become sons of God. We would receive the power to resist sin, to overcome it, and to keep the commandments of God. We would, we would show evidence of the love of Christ transforming us. The friends, uh, let us talk more of Christ. Let us talk more of his power to recreate us. Let us talk more of his power to free us from the bonds of sin in which we are caught. Let us talk more of his power to save. Let us talk, let us talk of his love in saving us. See, the lesson so beautifully says um, about the creator on the cross. What a theme it is, friends, that the one who created everything that exists, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Everything was made by Christ. And it was he who was hanging on the cross to save us. It was not a thing with him. And by the so Paul so beautifully writes, he did not count it as robbery. It was not, Jesus did not count the fact that he was God in a sense, that he was equal to the Father, that all power, he has all power to do whatever he wants. Do not count it as something to be held on to, something to be appreciated so much. It was his love for us weighed so much more than his position, his title, his authority for him personally. See, for us, when we see this happens generally in many cases, when we when we see others using maybe as a child, remember, I, I used to see people who come for a preaching use a use a laptop or something to project it onto the screen. And I used to feel, wow, how nice it would be to have a computer or a laptop. But when we actually got it, it it's, it's not we I realize it's not something that great. It was like that for Christ. Christ had it in him. He was equal to the Father. He was God. He is God for the matter in, in its very essence. And yet for him, it did not matter so much. It did not matter as much as, as was saving us. For him, saving us was worth everything, even if it means losing his own life. And, and it was he, the creator, who died on the cross. As we meditate on this day more and more, we understand what love truly is. That, that that uh, as a song, as a song, I think so beautifully says, love cannot fail, it never fails. Let us take hold of Christ and make sure of our salvation. May God help us for this journey. Amen. Let's close with a prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for this privilege to share your word, for this privilege to come and uh, meet each other once again, Lord. Father, we pray that we would realize the depth, Lord, the depth of the three messages, the issue that is at stake, and what will happen if we choose the wrong side. Help us, Lord, to consider each of these things sincerely, seriously, and take time, Lord, to think about these things. 
and to choose the right path. Father, thank you for this opportunity, this call, this time you've given us to think about the call and to, and to make a response. If we have not chosen it, if we are still lack is radical, Lord, if you are not decided, if you have not decided to be on the right side, we pray that you would, we would use this opportunity to open the door so firmly, Lord, that Christ will have a total and complete entrance into our lives. That we would believe on him and grasp this wonderful opportunity to become sons and daughters of God. But if you are already on that way, help us, Lord, to be encouraged to not be distracted by the world, not be discouraged by the failures we may fe face, by the disappointments that may happen in life. But Lord, to look forward to Christ and to keep moving, to keep moving and moving and moving until we reach the celestial city. Father, we pray that, that we would heal ourselves more and more with every passing day, that Christ will be all in all for us. Help us, Lord. Help us to um, to receive the mark of God and reject this, the, the mark of the beast, Lord. We send ourselves once again. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll see you, friends, once again. Um, God willing, next week. <laughs>